Cats. Hey everyone, how you doing? Hey, hey. So, uh, yeah, so uh, Loki and I are going to chat a little bit about VR. Um, just to get this started, how many people here have, uh, have tried the Oculus Rift or the HTC Vive? Just uh, have had a chance to try some VR. Okay, so some of you, not a lot of you yet. Okay. Yep. So um, today we're going to talk a bit about kind of our experiences in VR, what we've seen, and what we, uh, what we think is going to happen in the future. So maybe to get started, you know, Loki, you've been in this industry a while. Yep. Why did you decide to get into VR? And what's your... That's actually a really good question. So back in 2012, um, this is actually before Oculus was even announced. Um, Yuka and I, that's the co-founder and myself, we were looking at interaction in gaming and storytelling. And anyway, she had these ideas of like, identifying more and communicating more deeply with uh, virtual characters, I guess. And initially, she wanted to do that in a handheld environment. But I said, like, the technical challenges at the time are very high for this. They're, it, like, probably too high. We need to wait a couple of years for that. Or we can try it in VR, because the technology around VR is a lot more well-behaved. Like, we can do eye tracking much, much easier in VR than we can on a handheld device, because the sensors are close to your eyes. and. Um, so we thought, well, why not let's make this prototype where you talk with, uh, it's not really talk with a character. You basically would make eye contact with this character in a virtual reality setting. And a lot of people really liked it. But they didn't so much like just the character. They're like, hey, this thing is really cool. You should make it. And so when the crescendo became loud enough, we kickstarted it. We were the. Uh, I think second most successful VR headset on Kickstarter. How, I think. Many, how much did you raise on Kickstarter? Uh, over 500, oh, sorry, 480K, I think. So it wasn't like, wasn't earth shattering, but it wasn't bad. So. And, and when was that? Wow, 2014. Yeah, so this is like at the start, the Oculus oh, hasn't 2015? come out yet. Maybe yeah. the, 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 the Oculus DK2 was out. So this is very. Yeah, 2015, yeah. The DK2 was out. Um, that was the state of the art. Um, our headset. When we were in prototype stage, we had a WQHD screen, so it was 70% more pixels than it. So everyone was like really blown away by the resolution. Um, by the way, we now actually have 40% more pixels than Oculus, so uh, we're uh, we're winning the resolution game because it was really important for eye tracking, foveation, so uh, rendering. Well, yeah, I digress, but uh, there are a lot of advantages to having eye tracking in VR. And as we moved away from making this interaction scenario and actually making the hardware, we became aware of all of these needs for the technology that we we're making. So it actually grew very organically. We just started with a, an interesting idea, and it expanded and tumbled out of control. And as it tumbled out of control, it then blew up. And then we're now controlling that company that's like 50 times bigger than it was at the start. As a, yeah. Uh, how big are you guys now? So, well. I said 50 times bigger, but that's like maybe an exaggeration. We're currently 30 people, but our current hiring plan is to 50 this year. So, and, and so um, you know, Fove is focused on one of the the main unsolved areas in VR. Um, both the the Oculus and the HC Vive, they have uh, they have hand track controllers, they have positional tracking within the space, but uh, you guys are specifically focused on eye tracking. Yep. And maybe you could talk a little bit about why eye tracking is, is so important to creating immersion in virtual reality. So it's actually not important. Well, it depends on how you define immersion. So one of the things that um, I get annoyed at is the definition of immersion and presence in virtual reality. Like just being in a world doesn't make you present in the world, in my opinion. Um, this is, of course, like it's a battle of semantics here. But one of the most important things for me is the world being aware of you. The people in the world knowing what you're doing, what you're thinking, what your intentions are. So a character in virtual reality to me, well, if you look around in the content in VR, it's very rare to have solid character interaction. They're always just going to be talking at you, looking at you, and kind of awkwardly not doing what they really would if they were a natural entity. Um, so often we'll encounter a very hard, uncanny barrier. So like uh, summer, summer lessons, that's a pretty rare thing where they put a lot of effort into character communication. But even still, your interactions, they mostly happen with 
sort of menu prompts, and it's very, very artificially prompted. Um, we would like to make that much more natural. So having characters just in, innately aware of where you're looking enables them to do something like if I'm staring at that bottle of water, a character can come in, maybe pick it up, and start talking about it, because it might have been an artifact that was important to the story. And when I was looking at it, they prompt about it, rather than just forcing the issue, like waving it in my face and saying, hey, here's the thing. So I feel that VR can be made as a storytelling medium much more interesting by adding eye tracking, giving your characters that are in the world with you a theory of mind. Yeah, so one of the things that we've seen is that um, you know, some of the more compelling applications in VR tend to be with other people. Yep. So even, it's not just about AI characters as well. It's also about the fact that when you're in VR yep. with, say, um, a coworker yes. or uh, your family member or friend, that you have an idea of this, you, like you have an idea of where they're looking, if their attention is on you. These are nonverbal cues that we often, you know, subconsciously take notice of in real life. Yep. But they don't really yet exist in VR because we lack the technology to actually track people's eyes up until now. That's right. Well, the technology was never lacking. Like Eye tracking has been around for a very long time. We just brought it into the VR world, and we took our own spin on it. So we did some optimizations. Our stuff works extremely fast, and the pipelines optimize stream for VR. But the technology that we're using is fundamentally the same as what was available 10 years ago in different settings. Like, for example, the military, they use it for aiming their helicopters uh, sometimes. But yeah, there's like this technology has been around. We've just applied it to an area that we think sorely needs it. and. Um, yeah. And so so what's what's your strategy? How are you guys trying to get this in the hands of how are you guys trying to get this in the hands of consumers? So that's a very good question. Um, the strategy was make the thing question mark, question mark, question mark, dollars, dollars, yeah. dollars, question like, mark, like question basically mark, question like mark. every startup. Yeah. Right. Um, that's so like in all my pitches, that's basically what I hear. Yeah, it's like, right? hey, we'll make the thing and then question mark, question mark, question mark, profit. Yeah, dollar signs, um, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like, then, then we're a billion dollar company. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> the plan is we make this thing, we get it out to people and see what people do with it. And what's really interesting is we have a lot of researchers playing with our stuff. Um, we have also, interestingly enough, we've actually formed a cooperation with a large net cafe provider. And um, we're going to be working with video streaming stuff as well and foveating that. And we're, we've got a lot of technology that we're working on now, so it's a lot of fun. Um, but the strategy was to get it into the hands of as many people as possible and make people realize what eye tracking can bring to VR while we then go and make another one. Like, we're, we're going to be playing a, another hardware play in the future, very near future, actually. And um, so. We know what people liked. We know what people didn't like. We know what we have to pay very, very special attention to in the future. And um, yeah, we're, we're going to be coming in and making some new cool things in VR. But uh, the, our strategy is essentially as a hardware company with um, R&D bent and uh, also a licensing model as well. So, 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 so let me ask you. Let me ask you the hard question, right? Sure. So you're you're up against really big, well-capitalized companies like yep. HTC and, and Oculus slash Facebook, yep. right? So how are you? Well, we're in the same fish tank anyway. Yeah. So, so, how are you, um, so, so how are you essentially competing with these guys when you're also building a, building a headset? Well, competing on a technical level is not that difficult. Like, if you, were, if you were to make, say, paint the picture of us being a competitor to HTC or Oculus, it doesn't make business sense. Um, on a technical level, we can achieve the same things they achieve. Hardware is hardware. Tech, like, it's just a matter of time and energy and talent at that point. We have plenty of these things. Um, we can make a really good gadget. But to compete directly with one of these big players wouldn't make sense. What we want to do is extend the market ahead of what they're doing. Bring bring interesting things to the table before the other guys get around to it, and maybe trailblaze a bit. And uh, you know, we are open to licensing our technologies as well. And uh, he touched on something very interesting just a moment ago, which was uh, avatar communication and things like this. Uh, we have some projects in the pipeline where we have full face tracked, not just the eyes. Eyes are super important, but when we get the face in as well, it becomes pretty magical. Although I'm pretty sure I wasn't allowed to say that, but whatever. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that's your that's your that's your sound bite for this for this talk. 
Yeah. So, I mean, you, you talked a little bit about extending the market and, and looking to what's next, right? Yeah. So, I mean, where do you see the future of kind of VR and AR and, and this field going? What, what really gets you excited? Where do you, where do you, where do you see us being in maybe a year? So, a, a year is very interesting. Um, or or next couple of years. No, no, like, no, next like a though, year yeah. is still very interesting. It's a small, small timeline where maybe a lot of people would think not a lot of innovation is going to happen in, in just one year. Like we'll see like a tiny bit higher resolution and what? Maybe some better controllers. Um, I don't think that's the case. I think in a year's time, we're going to start seeing whether the technology can be ubiquitous or not. We're going to see if virtual reality uh, and indeed augmented reality or augmented virtual reality, which is the new thing I like, um, talking about, but yeah, we'll see if this can be applied to our everyday life and see if we can build a culture around this technology that can kind of change the way humanity operates. Um, so I think next year is going to be that year, whether we, we, we decide whether VR is really going to shine or be a niche gaming market. Uh, and yeah. you think that's going to happen between 2017, 2018? Yeah. So I, I think that year is basically the best chance that the industry has to like throw down and show the world what VR is capable of being and that it's not just the toy. And, and wh why, do you, why do you think it's only that, that year? I like, think what's happened so far that, that makes you believe that? It, it's, it's really difficult um, like, to say. I, I don't want to torpedo the industry or anything like that, but I believe people's attention is fickle. We have people's attention right now, and we have a lot of a people's attention right now. But we don't want to go the way of the Kinect. Like the Kinect was a massively awesome piece of technology. Yeah. It only got used for mini games, yeah. and like, don't want to, don't yeah. want that. So for everyone's benefit, the Kinect was the accessory that came with the the Xbox gaming console. It basically was able to track people and hands within a space. Um, it was considered like part of Microsoft's core strategy, and they've taken a lot of that technology and put it into the Hololens and some of the yeah. things that they're doing with augmented reality. But as a standalone device, it kind of failed because it never really got developer support. Yeah, basically because the developers didn't make cool stuff for it in time, it kind of fizzled out. And I feel like one of the things that the industry as a, as a whole is doing is, um, I mean, there's a hell of a lot of effort going into content, but is it the right content? That's a, a question I'll throw to everyone. Like, are we as an industry doing the right thing by emphasizing gaming, or should we be somewhere slightly different? <laughs> so um, I think uh, there are just so many places where VR can shine. It's going to become very relevant to everyone's life in the future, regardless of what happens next year. I just think that next year's behavior will define how the industry grows over the next five. Um, so you know, from our perspective, we've invested in about 26 companies. Um, in VR and AR and, and just at kind of the seed stage level. So we have a pretty wide view of, of what's happening. And we have some pretty strong opinions, too, on, on where we think the industry is. So, um, you know, from my perspective, uh, I agree. Like, you know, I'm, our entire fund is focused around VR succeeding. Yep. But that being said, we're very realistic and actually fairly bearish on consumer VR. Yep. Um, the reason why is just that one, these devices are, one, really expensive. Two, they're really bulky. Yep. Um, and three, just like there's not really yet like killer applications for consumers. Not yet. Right? I think they're around the corner. It's like, what do, you, what do you think like would be one of the missing pieces to have consumer VR just click and become everywhere? So, you know, my thesis on this is that, you know, VR, the, the problem, one of the problems with VR right now is that it's kind of a very broad term. Yes. So to give you some perspective, there's... Uh, you know, uh, PC VR, which is the, the Oculus Rift and the HC Vive. Yep. There is console VR, which is the, the PlayStation VR and maybe potentially other VR systems yep. for consoles. Then there's mobile VR, which is the, the Samsung Gear VR um, and the Google Daydream. Yep. And then the Google Cardboard, which is kind of like a, a worse version of that. And so, yep. you know, my thesis is that unlike your mobile phone, when like, there was a reason to go and buy it and go and a reason to upgrade your phone to get new capabilities to go from like a, a fixed function k or, or, or yeah. phone to like a, a smartphone. In VR, there's not really a reason yet to go out and buy it. No. So I think that most people, um, including potentially most of the people here in this audience, are actually going to own their first VR device when their phone supports it by default. 
So Google released a standard uh, called Google Daydream, yep. which is now part of the Android standard. Yep. And more manufacturers are signing up and starting to release phones that have kind of this VR standard built in. Yep. And eventually, you know, there's, the theory is, is that Apple is going to release something this year. We'll see. That'll be really big for everyone. So I think a big part of it is just people having their hands in the, on, on the hardware. Yep. And a good chunk of that is going to come from just upgrading your phone one day and being like, oh, wow, it supports VR. Let me give it a shot. Yep. And at that point, you know, we got to hope that there's compelling enough applications there that people are going to want to use it. Absolutely. And that's, that's what brings me back to another thing like, I'm really keen on is this, like, what are the strong, like, where does your VR lend itself? Like, what are the most powerful use cases for it? Um, how does VR differ from augmented reality as well? This is another, another thing that I'm dealing with a lot in, in, um, in my stuff. Like, I, I shouldn't be focused so much on this, but um, I think that augmented reality and virtual reality are seeing the same thing from different perspectives. And VR is going to basically give way not to augmented reality, but mixed reality is going to be approached from two sides. And we're going to meet in the middle and have a very powerful connection with our devices in the future that basically ground like what we do in physical space and virtual space. Yeah. Uh, so, so for the benefit of the audience, you know, uh, mixed yeah, reality is uh, this, this world in which the majority of what you're seeing is the real world, but there's virtual objects that you're able to naturally yeah. interact with. Yeah. Uh, this is what the HoloLens is going for. This is what Magic Leap is going for. But there's a lot of hardware and technical problems that yeah. first need to be solved before yeah. it's available to the general public. Yeah. Yeah, solved or sidestepped, but definitely. <laughs> said, like, said like a true technologist. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are many things we can do to make things cool. So, um, and, yeah. And, and so, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is that, um, you know, the, a lot of these a lot of these problems you're saying sidestep, and I think that's an interesting thing to, to yeah. kind of touch on for a second. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is that everyone really focuses on on when is virtual reality going to get adopted by the consumer market. Um, yeah. What we've started doing is we've actually stopped investing as much in consumer-based companies um, and started to focus more on business applications and industrial applications of these technologies. Yeah. And there's a few reasons why. Uh, the first is that um, if you actually solve a business's problem, they're going to they're going to be willing to pay whatever the cost of the hardware is. So yeah. you know we have a company that's building uh, simulation software that simulates medical devices, Great. and they're selling to very large medical device companies as a sales tool to go and sell these like giant MRI machines to doctors. So instead of you know, having to fly the doctor out to your demo center or having to ship the machine out to do demos, you just bring a virtual reality kit. They're able to see what the machine is like in virtual reality yeah. and then get a, make a buying decision off of that. Yeah. And so, so, sorry, go ahead. So do you think like VR showrooms and like VR marketing, where someone literally walks in, they drop down their tracker if they need one, if it's inside out, they use inside out. But do you reckon that like room scale VR is going to be used in just general sales in the future in other industries as well? A hundred percent, right? Yep. Especially especially in areas where real estate is at a premium or you're yep. not able to demo or show off all the options. Yep. So for example, we're seeing this in Lowe's. Lowe's is a massive uh, furniture, um, home retailer in the US. And what they have is they have essentially a, a, a hologram kitchen we're able to go in there and essentially customize your kitchen with, with the cabinets yeah. you want, with the, the countertops you want, yeah. walk around it, and essentially get a real sense of space. Yeah. And so for something like that, look, Lowe's will spend $1,000 on a PC. They'll spend another $1,000 on a virtual reality system. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's bulky, because they'll figure out a way to have someone yeah. man it. And it could easily turn into multiple tens of thousands of dollars of sales for them, yeah. so it easily pays for itself. No, absolutely. Like I have fantasies of like buying a car in a couple of years' time. Uh, heck, why not three months' time? Uh, where you just jump into your VR system and your car is there in front of you. And I, I hit the, the seats, play with my swatches, I paint the car, place the components that I want on it, and just build this thing, and then it gets shipped to my door. Um, <laughs> you know, like, why not? We can do this. We can make VR a part of everyday experiences. And I think it's going to be good for giving people a connection to their devices as well. Like, it's not just something you ordered, because like, I feel that like customization is super important. And customization in VR is basically where it's at when it comes to sales. Like, like presenting just a thing, that's great. But if it's a thing that you can customize, you can make someone have that hands-on customization experience and make them feel more attached to the thing they just made. 
And I, I mean, think that's kind of cool as well. So this is a really big macro trend that's happening right now in e-commerce. There's a lot of companies yeah. now that are direct to consumer. that are all about providing a consumer with choice and the thing that that's basically their version. So yeah. there's a Y Combinator company that launched recently yeah. that essentially custom tailors a shirt to you. Yeah. And so the idea of being able to, one, take that shirt and then see what it looks like on a virtual avatar. Yeah. And you is, can spin it around. Yeah, you can like you can you pose yourself and yeah. like so. It, there, there's a lot of really crazy technology that's that's starting to just it's just on the cusp of coming out. Yeah. Um, and you know one of the other areas is that you know we I want to I want to touch sure. on is is on the e-commerce side, but also on the on the education side. Yes. And so um, you know call. a space that we're investing in pretty heavily right now is in uh, in corporate training. So we invest in a company that is is you know using corporate training for good. They've uh, They've essentially, they're using VR to put you in the shoes of someone that is uh, negotiating their salary. So in, in the U.S., there's a, there's a big kind of uh, macro discussion right now about the fact that there's a, there's a gender gap for wages. Yeah. Yeah. And so what they're doing is they're essentially giving uh, women these, uh, this, this, this module, this VR tool that puts them in simulated negotiations yeah. with a hiring manager so they can learn to negotiate for higher yeah. salaries and learn to ask for what they're worth. Yeah. And the idea behind that is to essentially close the gender, the gender gap in yeah. wages. And that's a, that's a brilliant application. And one of the things that I think eye tracking is going to shine in as well, like I uh, shouldn't be plugging for so much. Well, I should, but yeah, whatever. Um, our eye tracking can help that kind of thing by focusing people like, if I'm looking down like this and not making much eye contact, we can catch you out. Or if I'm sort of looking like this, but I'm sort of staring away because I really like even though I'm tricking the system into like I'm gaze locked to your head, but I'm really not looking at it. That's probably a sign that you're not confident, and you need to increase your confidence. And so we actually one of our side projects when we first started Fov was working with autistic people on training how to make eye contact. Um, we we didn't end up deploying that system. We ended up going into the hardware and letting other people make that. But um, that was one of our very initial applications was. Uh, Eye contact training and, and uh, quantization. And, and what was the what was the res what were the results of that? That sounds really that sounds fascinating. Well, I'm just going to be like fully, fully transparent with everyone. Like I'm actually on the spectrum myself. I have like a light version of autism, and I taught myself how to make eye contact with this system and become completely aware of my gaze, not just how it was perceived by me, but other people. Like we, I had a spotlight attached to my eyes, so wherever I looked, there'd be a spotlight beam. And I would realize that if I'm staring at the table, other people would be following my gaze and looking at the thing that I'm looking at. And that's like becoming aware that this is a physical thing that other people actually use to interact with you um, was a fundamental game changer for me. Like it never occurred to me. <laughs> so I, I guess what's pretty amazing, this is the first time I've heard this. Um, yeah. And I didn't realize it before this session. And like I've noticed that you've been making a lot of eye contact. So yeah. clearly, you know, that's a really. Uh, really great example of the power yeah. of VR. So no, on absolutely. that, we're out of time. Um, yeah. That's a great place to end. So no uh, thanks so much for the time. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your, the conference. We hope to see you out there later at the after yeah. party.